And tell us about DomCon. How did that come about? What, what is that for someone who may not know about it? DomCon is a, a professional and lifestyle domination convention. I started in 2004, and it's held twice a year. It's been in Los Angeles, um, this will be our 16th year. Uh, we did 12 years in Atlanta, and this will be our fourth year in New Orleans. But the, um, back in 2000, uh, when the internet had come around, and I was actually on an internet, and had chat rooms and things, I was in this Yahoo group uh, for BSM. And one day I tried to log on, and I couldn't get on. So I emailed the moderator and told him I was having a problem. And they said, oh, that's because you've been thrown out of the group. I was like, what? And she said, well, you're, um, you're doing professional. And this is not a program group. This is a, uh, for professional, I mean, this is for lifestyle people. I said, I've been lifestyle for a lot longer. But, but they wouldn't have it. And I felt at that point, most people don't get into programming, pick up it one day and go, hey, I think I'll, I'll do that as a career and start. They're come out of the lifestyle. They're, you know, something about it. And the Dalcon was something that I wanted to kind of bridge those two communities together and bring a better understanding of the lifestyle and the professional. Um, uh, people told me it wouldn't work for years. Um, uh, and actually, when I first thought about it, I was at an, an event in New York, in New York and somebody was putting together a domination convention in San Francisco, and they invited me. And I thought, oh, somebody's already doing it. So I kind of put it in the back burner, and I went in 2002 to this event, and I won't mention the name of it or anything, but, but I knew there wasn't going to be another one. It just was not, it was not good. So I came back and started working on the concept of DomCon, which I assume was going to be a large LA event. And a month into uh, promoting it, I think in the national event, people from all over the country um, wanting to come. And but my the, the naysayers all said, "It's never, never happen. The pros are going to try to one up each other. You're not going to get any cooperation. Two communities aren't going to come together. The pros aren't going to want to share uh, business secrets." Uh, but they did. They came to the con, and it was wonderful. And the chatter after Dalcon was that the lifestyle people were saying, wow, I met a lot of these pros, and they're real people. They really are doing this because they love it. And the pros, who were, a lot of them were looking at it as what were above the life of the hobbyists. You know, like, wow, these, these lifestyle people were teaching classes, and I learned some stuff. They didn't know what they're doing. So it, it, it brought a mutual respect between the two lifestyles a little bit better and bridge that, which was my goal. But then we also had people from the fetish community and the leather, and the leather community and coming in as well. So it really brought all aspects of the community. And we're still building on that. But it's an international event now. We're looking at doing um, Sydney, Australia in 2020. Oh, wonderful. And, um, and then in Europe, maybe 2021, 22. So we're, um, we're we're growing, we've got actually pro-doms that will be representing every continent except for Antarctica. Wow. <laughs> and this one, we've got a pro-dom coming from South Africa uh, next month, or in May, for Domcon LA. Um, and it's embraced it, it's about classes, we have 50, 50 plus classes and workshops, we have two days of industry only classes, we have uh, socials all weekend long, we have like 70 vendor booths, we've got uh, a play party, we've got a fetish call, um, a award ceremony. It, it's continuing to grow. It's a five-day event now. Where are you looking in Europe? Um, well, we're actually hoping for either Berlin or uh, London. Yes. Wow. Wow. But, you know, but we're going to get Sydney under our belt first and then, and then move that way. When are you going to Sydney? Uh, the dates are still being negotiated, but it looks like it will be mid to late. Mid, right now it looks like it's mid-year uh, 2020. Oh, okay. okay. Well, tell us about your work with LA Leather Coalition and Erotic City, because you took a very interesting and unique attitude regarding joining 
leather um, well, coalition? Well, the, I think the LA Leather Coalition reached out to me in 2005 and, um, uh, and actually asked me to come in and become a member. And then, uh, the, uh, I mean, even though I had been in the leather community as far as like unofficially, you know, with being mentored and things, that I wasn't involved in, a, in an official or organized manner at that point. So I went to their meetings and they asked me to join. And my thing was that, what can we bring to you? Uh, it, I never asked them, what can you do for us? It was it always, it was like, okay, sanctuary and Mr. Cyan comes in to the Leather Coalition. How do we benefit you? What can we do? And they said, well, you've, uh, you were aware of Don Con, and I was nominated for like five South Bend honors that year. And they said, so you're already making a contribution, and we think you could make a contribution on this board. And that, uh, so we joined it, and um, unfortunately that year, uh, the year prior, actually, uh, they took a big step on putting on Australia Weather and big hotel and everything, and unfortunately, <clears throat> it was like, it ended up about fourteen to sixteen thousand dollars in the hole. So, having done fundraisers and a lot of charity events myself, we formed the fundraising event. I mean, fundraising committee. Um, myself, Dr. Larry Burton, uh, uh, Dave Rhodes, Genesis, uh, Carol, uh, Ron Nevis, and Cody, who was the previous Mr. Other Leather, and we. For the next two years, we put on pancake breakfasts, roller skate nights, Rocky Horror nights. I mean, we worked our ass off and we got the coalition out of debt. And um, then we really found out that the prior people had not been up on having their their fees to the state, so there was another $8,000. So we continued the fundraising, but eventually we, we got it all caught up and stuff. So I felt really good about being able to be part of something that was close to my heart, that had a purpose, and was something that brought all our elements of our leather community together. Um, Erotic City was something that uh, somebody in the leather community was working with back in, I think it was 2006. I can't remember, 2005, 2006. And they asked if I wanted to help. So I kind of came on board as a volunteer, and I was uh, a, the vendor coordinator, their um, sponsorship chair, and uh, basically the organizer of the Erotic City within LA Pride. And we did that for a number of years. And, uh, and it was very, I loved it because it was embraced the King community, uh, it was about education, it brought the head community into it. Um, you know, we had the sanctuary sponsored the outdoor dungeon at Erotic City, and it was very fulfilling and rewarding to do it and to help and be part of it. But then we ran into something in 2011 or 2010 that um, there were some changes made, and in 2011, not everybody was even was uh, invited to join. Uh, erotic city and one particular element was not and that was um they said they male dom female sub were not welcome and uh, so it's a head community questioned it and we all went in and having a little bit of experience with working with them and in 2007 i was actually an honoree for west hollywood and la pride and we went in there and addressed it and we were told that you know, men, male, male is good, female, female is okay, female top, male bottom is okay, but we can't have male top, female bottom because we don't want to send a message of domestic abuse. And I said, but it's about education. I mean, this is what, this is our chance to tell people what the difference between abuse and DSM is. And they said, well, we had two complaints last year about it. Two complaints? 
if the Hilton did follow that same pattern, Malcolm wouldn't be around anymore. Okay. Then I, I question it. And then they said something that stirred me deeply. And that was, and I won't mention the name, the person said, this is our event, not yours. So I stepped away from the light pride, and as did most of the head community. And uh, <clears throat> fortunately, things changed over the next couple of years, and in 2017, I received a call and asked if I would produce a Rotic City. And that, um, the, and because they had nobody to do it, and if I couldn't, then they were not going to have it. So I thought, well, it's, the only way to change things is to take a seat at the table. So I agreed, and I went in, and I, uh, I put the group the Erotic City together. We did it in about seven weeks, coordinated the whole thing. We brought gay, lesbian, trans, heterosexual, white, black, Asian, Hispanic. Yeah, well, we brought everybody. I brought the entire community in, every aspect that we could to perform and have interactive spaces, and it went over really well. And after that, they asked me to join the board of directors. And with all the things that I've got going on, I had to think about it because I'm, I, one thing that I use my time wisely on is things that I have goals and that, that I want to do things with. And I really question whether I had the time. But again, it was like, you can't complain if you're not willing to take a seat at the table and do something about it. So I accepted. And, um, and now I'm one of the officers and the secretary for the uh, uh, board of directors and working with uh, LA Pride producing Ironic City and I'm on the uh, special committee for our 2020 LA Pride. This will be our 50 year anniversary. So, but basically, it was, it's always been for me about what, what can I bring to the table and what can I do. Again, and unbeknownst to me at the time, that it had more to be bigger than my upbringing. Because of my, again, my upbringing was about if you work hard and you're sincere and you put the effort in, it will come back to you. Okay? That it, everything is an investment. You can invest your money or you can invest your time. But nothing comes free. Okay? So, you know, I love my community. My community is something that in some ways I can look at and say, save my life. Okay, not maybe like suicidal ways, but I found my place in life that I'm happy, I'm happy every day. Uh, it's, it brings me joy. It, I see the people going to Erotic City, to LA Pride, the Don Con, the people who I wish was, that was around when I was their age. Okay, so it means a lot to me to know that they're not going through the same turmoil and tribulations and things that I went through growing up. Well, tell us about the Ms. Sanctuary Leather and the Ms. LA Leather contests. Um, okay. Let's see. Well, we started Sanctuaries uh, joined the LA title system back in 2007. Um, we were the first uh, non-specific gay organization to take and uh, Put a contestant in the Mr. Ugly Leather. We um, we were the first dungeon and pansexual space to become a member of the LA Leather Coalition, and uh, so we kind of had a little bit of a history about breaking new ground. Uh, Don Con did that, and so on. Well, the women's community has never been real organized, in, in here, and you know, with my position. Um, and on the board for LALC uh, and my uh, participation with uh, LA Pride and LA and the Erotic City and things like that put me in a nice position to be able to, to make a difference. And in my DS household, that's our mantra, make a difference. So I, in, in 2014, I decided, you know what, let's, let's do a Miss Sanctuary contest, a compliment to the you know, because Genesis had run for International Miss Leather in 2010, I think it was, and um, the, they had other cities and they had a whole women's community out there that was flourishing, but not necessarily in LA. 
So I thought, this is the one minute kickstart things. And uh, I went to Shay Flanagan uh, at Don Con at Random, and I told her in 2013 that I was going to do a Miss Sanctuary contest, and would she like to be a judge? And she said, oh, absolutely. And we got back to LA, and a few weeks later she said, no, I've been thinking about that. You, um, you asked me to be a judge. And she says, you know, I've been talking about that. And I said, yeah. Said, I'd like to decline that, because I'd like to become a, a contestant. I said, wow, that would be great. So we, in 2014, we held our first um, Mr. and Miss Sanctuary contest together. And um, Shay won. And when I, um, I laid down a couple of things to her, and I said, you know, it would be, we need to get the community kick started. Okay. Um, and one thing I would like you to do is to build a compliment to the LA Band of Brothers. With their sisterhood needs something for women title holders. So that was the task that I gave her for her title year. And she founded the um, South End Title Sisters. Um, and then she uh, talked to me about wanting to maybe do Miss LA Leather. If, you know, and I told her I would be supportive with her. I couldn't, I could be supportive. I could not be involved because doing the sanctuary, it would be a conflict of interest. So, but she had all my support. So she busted her butt, she went out and did it. 2015, Miss LA Leather contest uh, restarted because they had been dormant for I think about eight, 10 years, maybe more. Um, and uh, our Miss Sanctuary won Miss LA Leather. And then uh, it spurred a couple of other contests around LA to have a women's contest. And, you know, in 2016, you know, our Miss Sanctuary won again, another one. So we kind of, I feel, I feel very proud. I feel like Sanctuary has, um, has helped break the ground to get the women's leather community established and started. And, you know, we're no longer the, you know, the focus of the women's community here. But it was never meant to be the focus. It was meant to, to be a starting point, to grow upon. And I'm happy to see the women's community grow as it is. And I'm happy to see the men's community embracing the women's community to a point. I mean, the, the evil has, has nights for women and, and things which a lot of people, when you leave LA, are, they say, wait a minute, the eagles, how can they let women in there? But Charlie and Hunter have been so supportive over the years. Um, I mean, there's some controversy this year with Mr. and Miss LA Leather contest being put together. But, um, you know, that's the whole other story. <laughs> Switching gears a little bit, although you were raised Catholic, you are now Wiccan. And when we were preparing for this interview, you said that there are a lot of correlations between Wicca and BDSM. Please explain that. Sure. Um, well, I was brought up Catholic, and uh, it became a conflict because again, my parents taught me don't don't listen to everything you're told. Question things. You know, don't you're, you don't grow up to be a follower. Grow up to be a leader. Okay. And knowledge is power. Okay. So you know, I did question things. And in the Catholic religion, there were things that to me that just didn't make sense. Okay, you know, and they were very contradictory to me. You know, I would be told that you know God is all loving and everything else, but if you didn't do X, Y, Z, you were going to burn in hell for eternity or something. It's like wow, that sounds kind of really revenge, you know? Then it's like all loving. It sounds like somebody who's saying you're going to do things the way I tell you to do it, or you're going to suffer for eternity. So it didn't make sense to me. Okay. I saw contradictions in, in behavior, uh, that I was told that I could go to confession and, uh, and do penance and stuff, and all the things I did would be forgiven, okay? But I had friends who would go out and steal candy and go to confession, and all of a sudden they're like holier than now, and they go out and steal more candy, and they go to confession again. So it was like my, my spirituality being brought up was that if there's God, then when he gave us a brain to think and he gives a conscience to know the difference between right and wrong. So my philosophy has been, I don't believe in religion, 
I, I think it's bogus, I think it's manipulative and um, controlling. And being a, so coming from a science background in college, it, I'm very analytical, so you know, it didn't make sense that there's some you know, being out there um, that's, that created everything. So my thing was, like, you know, if there is something I have to meet my neighbor one day, I'm going to be able to take a look him in the eye and say, you know what, I may have made some mistakes, but everything that I did, I did because I thought it was right. Okay? And you know what? And my conscious, if I found out it was wrong, and my conscious told me it was wrong, I didn't do it again. So I drifted away from that and said, you know, I have nothing to do with any religion. And Genesis at the time was, um, or you know, when I, after I was married and stuff, or before I was married actually, was Wiccan. And one day she said to me, you know what? I do everything you want to do. I go where you want to go. I support you in everything you do. You know, and she was really heavily into, into the Wiccan uh, practice. And she said, you know, and I've asked you before just to, to explore it, and you won't. And I said, well, I don't believe in religion, but you know something? I will, okay? And, but, and she said, that's all I ask. If you don't like it, you don't like it. So I went, and I realized that how it resonated with me was that it was about karma, which I believed in. It was about how you live your life. It was about what you put out there and what's going to come back. Um, it was about the, the elements, um, you know, fire and, you know, when you go through elevations in the area. And when I raised, it went from uh, to becoming high priest, high priestess, I, um, I did something about BDSM. I did night play and I did fire play and, you know, uh, you know, temperature play with ice, which was all the elements, the elements of air, the elements of, uh, of water, of, of, the, of fire. And it was like, wow, wait a minute, this, this red thing, like, I'm also very ritualistic in my play. I like to take and set the ambience and I set the scene. To, to me, the uh, BSM scene doesn't start when I when I pick up a flogger. It starts in how in the ambience of the room and setting it up or doing the rituals. And this is what this was, was ritual. And then they weren't telling me that there's a supreme being that's going to punish me if I don't do what they say. So it was it was like this this is not what I thought it was. This is this is a spirituality. And it's something that touches me in the inside, and it's something I believe in. I believe in karma. I believe in, you know, what goes around comes around. Uh, the foundation and everything involved with it, I can identify with. You know, so, you know, I thank Jen for, you know, opening that door for me and helping me um, explore it because it's, um, it's given me some balance in my life. It's, uh, I'm not so cynical now about, you know, um, spirituality. Tell us about white men's privilege. What is that? <laughs> I, I think I had the unique, being transgender, being unique, and having grown up male, and seeing how you're treated as a male. I didn't transition when I was young. I transitioned older in life. and uh, so. You know, I lived as an adult male in the in the executive world, in the music business, and everything else. And I can tell you that the way I was treated as a male and the way I'm treated as a female are different. They are much different. I mean, as a female, they're very courteous. Um, and they're very respectful, stuff like that. But respectful in a different way. It's you. As a male, I never questioned on a decision I was going to make. You know, I could take, I had a trans am, I could go and buy a part to my car and never get questioned on it. You know, after transitioning, it's like, are you sure you need this? Is this hard throw this at the right part? You know, little things like that. Um, yeah, the way people move out of your way, they do it, um, and then, I guess, turn is the, as female, they move out of your way as courtesy. As male, I feel they move out of your way as respect. Okay, so at least that's been my experience. Uh, that's been the way that I've related to it. I've, I've lived on both sides of that line. Um, and I mean, there's probably even more to it. I mean, every, every day. I think. But also, I, 
as male, I am worried about going out uh, at night, you know, I mean, I was in the music business. I would be producing shows in the Sunset Strip. I had no problem going to my car at two or three in the morning, okay? But when I transition, I, I don't do that. You know, I don't walk by myself, you know, at three o'clock in the morning, you know, down in Hollywood or LA or anything like that. Um, not only because of female, because of the, of the, of the vulnerability that you feel. And it's not even that I feel this vulnerable because of me. I mean, I, I think I can take care of myself, but it's the, it's the vulnerability and the empowerment that the other person may have. And if they feel that they're more powerful than you, that's when you're in danger. As a male, they would not feel as, as they were more powerful, they'd feel more of an even basis. And being transgender makes it even worse, because now it's not only do you fear about some kind of a sexual or anything like that, but now is it bordering on that that, that person, someone who's hateful, you know, and, and it becomes much more dangerous. Well, building upon that, there's a lot of violence toward transgender individuals. A lot of, many people are even murdered. What are your thoughts on that? It, I saw prior, I grew up in the 70s and the 80s when there was violence. I grew up watching, you know, the, the house next door to us uh, was sold and two men um, uh, bought the house. And everybody was nice, but you know, behind, you know, behind their backs, the whole neighborhood, you know, I think they're homosexual. I think they're homos, you know, and, and stuff and the negativity, and that you couldn't go in public holding hands, really. You know, you couldn't share any kind of intimacy or let people know that it was a kind of intimacy, you know, because people, number one, didn't understand, but people, there were other people who were, felt that it wasn't acceptable as far as God, or it wasn't acceptable as far as, is, uh, you know, men shouldn't do that. And, there were people who were getting beat up. Um, there were people who were you know, being prejudiced against and thrown out of their jobs and their, their homes and everything. And I've seen over the years things get better and get better and get more accepted. And we're, in my opinion, taking a, a huge step backwards in the last two years with the current administration. This, the, now don't get me wrong, I don't think I don't think there's more people that are hateful. They're just now got a louder voice. Before they didn't, they were there, and that's why I say that we, we still fear going out at uh, ourselves at night and things. We still you know, have to be aware of our surroundings but because they're back there. But now they've got a voice, and now they've been empowered and have a feeling of acceptance and uh, and as a result, the, the, the violence is, is on the rise again. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's sad because, um, yes, transgender, but even people of color, and more importantly, is, is transgender women of color are, are getting murdered all over this country every day. And there is no media coverage of that. It's, it's a, a sad situation. What advice can you offer a viewer or anyone else who may be here that's considering gender reassignment? Well, I think uh, number one is you've got to, how do I say it? Uh, there's people who are so sure of something, okay? And when you're sure of something, um, nobody can tell you different. And that can be a good thing and a bad thing. You know, one of the things I learned about psychology was that, especially being transgender, because it was a question that I wanted to make sure that I knew and I talked to my therapist about, and it was genuine. And what my therapist explained to me was that there's something called primary and secondary. And primary where is, it's really the way you're wired. That is who you are. But there's something called secondary that um, that's, can be very dangerous to you. And that is that you, 
dress, cross dress, whatever direction you're going, and you feel really good about it. And there are times when you may be going through family problems, you may be going through uh, problems with your work, lost a job, financial problems, and your escape is that cross dressing. And pretty soon psychologically what you start to associate is I feel good when I'm in that mode, but I feel bad when I'm in that mode. So you start to believe that maybe I'm transgender, maybe I belong, you know, I'll, for this argument say we'll say male to female right now. Well I want to dress in a dress, I feel really comfortable, I'm, you know, I'm not worrying about anything, I feel feel good, but you know, when I go back to my everyday male life, you know, I'm not unhappy. Well, the unhappiness is the result of having to deal with the day-to-day -day business. So you start emotionally thinking and associating it, so you start to lean toward that. And a lot of those people, when they're going to a therapist and the therapist questions it, okay, they're like, well, he don't know what he's talking about. I'm going to, you know, I know. And they make a mistake. Because it's not something you turn around and go back. So my advice is that Go into an open mind, and I can share that when I went to see a therapist for the first time, I had hoped, and a bit, I wasn't a praying type of person, but I hoped with all my heart that what I was going to find out was that I was a heterosexual cross-dresser, and it was a kink, and it was a sexual turn-on, because it would have been a lot easier in my life to stay male and, you know, and dress and have fun in playtime. And God, I don't know now that you know you can do it in public when it doesn't matter, things are fluid. But it was um, I went into it with an open mind and saying well, that's what I hope, but I'm going to find out what it is. And through my therapy, I you know a lot of times I thought my therapist, I questioned whether he was really trying to help me or not. It was really hard, but I realized in the long run that the, you go through a lot of tests and it's very serious. And um, uh, you have to be honest with your therapist. You have to be honest with yourself and accept whatever it really is and deal with it. Um, and then seek guidance. Uh, get mentoring. Um, feel proud, be honest, be yourself. And uh, just, you know, don't, don't live your life for everybody else in the world. What's the biggest misconception about you? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if there's any real misconceptions because I'm, I've always been really open. I've been open about being pro dom. I've been open about the music business. I've been open about being trans. So I don't know if there's any misconceptions. I, you know what? Maybe, maybe one would be that maybe, it's, maybe I wouldn't call it a misconception. Maybe it's just something you don't know. Is that I've been legally blind since 1994, and. Most people, are, it's, I don't think most people are aware of it. You know, I've been known for, I mean, people will tell you how good I am with throwing whips, you know. So for a long time, it's with the pro dom. I kept that as a kind of a secret, you know. You know, you know when it's funny, I say, oh yeah, I'm going to hit you with this whip, I'm blind. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know nothing gives a good level of confidence. But you know, uh, by now, people have seen me throw whips, they know how accurate I am, they know, it's, uh, so I have no problem, you know, Telling them, and I even joke about them. Just think if I can see. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Cyan, thank you for an amazing interview, and thank you for hosting us here at Sanctuary in LA. Thank you for